Welcome to the channel. This is the first video in a series of videos where we're going to be learning electronics through audio projects like synths, stomp boxes, audio amplifier projects and other all audio based projects. And we're going to go from very simple stuff all the way up to full synthesizers, modular, digital, analog. It's going to be great. So stick with me. We're going to start here today diving straight in with a super simple CMOS oscillator. In this case, we're going to be using a CD40106. So I'll write that down and it looks like this. All right, so this is the chip. This is a little marker that shows you where the first pin is. So if you're looking at the chip like this with the little marker here, pin one is straight to the left. And then we go anti-clockwise around the chip, increasing in, in pin number. So this is pin one, this is pin two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we go round this way to eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So it's a 14 pin chip, probably should have said that at the start. This pin here is power. So we're gonna be VDD, which is basically where we're gonna put, we're gonna use nine volts so that you can use a nine volt battery but you'd put the positive end of your nine volts battery here and the negative end here, which is going to be called VSS on the data sheet. Basically, we'll call this power in this, for this video and we'll call this ground. And we won't worry about the VDD and the VSS stuff for now. That basically just means because they're MOSFETs, you have the source and the drain and that's what gets attached to these two. Don't worry about it if you don't know what that means. So here's gonna be nine volts, and this is gonna be zero volts. And in between each of these pins, we've got six, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, inverting op amps, basically. And they're a special type of inverting op amp called a Schmidt trigger inverting op amp. And we'll go into detail about what that means in a second. So between each pin, so between pin one and two, we have one. And in between pin three and four, we have one. And so on in between each pin. I'll not go all the way around. Again, you can have a look at the data sheet if you want to see more about that. We're going to spin this round and zoom in on just pins one and two so we can see what's actually going on inside the chip. So this is kind of an expanded view of the chip. The first two pins this is pin one and this is pin two. Here's that little nubbin thing just so you can keep your bearings on what we're actually looking at in between these two pins i said earlier we had a schmidt trigger inverting op amp whatever that means so we'll go into what that means now so this is a symbol for an op amp right an op amp or an operational amplifier is what the full name and what that means is it's a kind of just a, an abstraction of a group of transistors basically that takes some sort of input and according to how it's set up and what the external components are, obviously inside the chip, we don't have to worry about any of that stuff, but um, it will produce some type of output depending on what's going on at the input. So in this case, um, it's a type of op amp that when the input signal goes over a certain threshold or under a certain threshold, the output will swing high or low. So this is the symbol for it. And so basically this is a Schmidt trigger. So what that means, if this was just an ordinary inverting op amp, um, the threshold will be halfway between the ground with zero volts and your power rail, which is in this case, nine volts in the case that we're using it. And um, so it wouldn't really work particularly well as an oscillator. So if we think about what an oscillator is, an oscillator is something that is produces a varying signal at a fixed frequency. So in our case, what's going to happen is we're going to have some circuitry out here, um, outside of the chip, that is going to provide a changing input signal that is also going to set the frequency for the what we're using this as is an oscillator, which will produce a square wave at the output at the frequency that we want it at. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how these thresholds behave and what makes this Schmidt trigger 
op amp different from a normal op amp. So as I said a second ago, normally we'll draw a little graph just to show what's going on. So this is time, just some random length of time, and this is uh, voltage on this axis. So we're going to start at zero volts down here, and this is just some arbitrary amount of time, not important for now. And this is nine volts, which is the max we can go to because that's our supply voltage. And so here's our threshold here at 4.5. Now what, which is halfway between zero and nine. Now what makes a Schmidt trigger special is that the threshold can change depending on whether you're going from low to high or from high to low. So if you're going from low to high, not only do you have to cross this 4.5 th volt threshold, but you also have to cross this 6 volt threshold. Right? And the original intention of this is that if you have a signal, this is to be used as a comparator. So if you have a signal that's like this, you know, hovering around 4.5, you don't want the output constantly swinging high and low and high and low and high and low. You want it to go significantly over the threshold or significantly below the threshold so that you're not misfiring constantly, so that you can actually accurately measure changes in a system that might have some noise, like real world systems, real world signals have noise. But we can take advantage of this and use these changing thresholds to provide a timed output signal that we can hear as a sound. So as I said, if you're going from low to high, you have to cross the four and a half and six volt threshold. And then it knows when you've crossed the high threshold and this threshold then moves down to three volts. And then for the output to swing again, you have to cross not only the 4.5 volt threshold, but the three volt threshold. And in a future video, we'll definitely go into op amps because they're really useful and it, it look into how all this kind of action happens. They rely on like positive and negative feedback and really interesting and really cool, but we're just doing the basics right now. So basically, how is this, is this circuit going to produce a variable frequency? So let's look at just the simple action of this as it is now. So let's say it's all plugged in, it's all switched on, and we've got some nine volt signal here that is going to slowly ramp up towards this uh, nine volts, right? So we'll apply that at time is equals, time equals zero. We've got zero volts here. So as I said, this is inverting. That's what this little bubble means, by the way. If you see a bubble on the output or on the input of any kind of logic gate, it means that it's an inverted. So we're going to ramp up like this. And nothing's going to happen until we cross this six volt threshold. And so before we cross that six volt threshold, we were sat in an off state and the output would be high because it's inverting. So while the input is low, the output obviously is going to be high. So we'll draw that on in red. So this whole time, the output is just sitting up here at nine volts. Now, as soon as this crosses this threshold, the output is going to swing low because the input is now high. Once it's gone over this six volt threshold, the input is now high. So the output being an inverter is going to swing low. Right. And now if we had the circuit set up exactly like this, that's all that would happen, right? It would go low. The output would stay high because there's nothing here to change. The, in the input would stay high, sorry, because there's nothing here to change what's going on at the input. The output's gone low. Everything is static. Um, but what we are actually going to do is we're going to put some circuitry outside to feed the output signal back into the input signal. And then this is going to drop and it's going to oscillate and it's just going to go back and forth, switching and rising and switching again and falling. And then we'll look at how we can control that oscillation to produce a variable pitch like I did at the start of the video. So. What we're going to do is we've got a what we've always had here that I didn't mention before because we didn't need to know. We had a capacitor here, which is how we got this ramp. So we've applied a voltage to this capacitor and a capacitor you can kind of think of as a tiny little battery, a tiny little rechargeable battery. So we applied a steady voltage to this, a constant voltage. And what that did was charge this capacitor up over time. Right. <laughs> Um, this is ground, by the way, this is the signal for ground. So we've got a capacitor connected to ground on the other end and the positive end of the capacitor connected to the input of pin one, which is the input of our op amp. 
right? Bear with me. So this is charging up, right? And once it charges up, this can detect what voltage is on here because they're connected. And once it goes over this six volt threshold, the output swings low. So how do we get the output to affect what's going on on this capacitor? Well, we're just going to simply have a variable resistor here. Just feeding back whatever's going on at the output through this resistor to the capacitor. So before this charged up, while this was all off, this output, remember, was high. So if I draw that on here, so we're going back to the start now at T equals zero seconds, right at this point here. This was at zero volts, right, which is this point here was at zero volts. I'll try and draw the green as the input. So this was at zero volts. This was at zero volts. This was at zero volts, this node here, which means that this point here was at zero volts as well, because this is all connected. Right, and the output was at 9 volts, because that's how we've got it set up, because it's inverting. And 9 volts is our power supply, which is what is supplied to here inside the chip. So we start here at 9 volts. And because this is at 9 volts, this node here, we call them nodes in electronics, where things are connected together. Um, this node here is at 9 volts, which means that this is at 9 volts. And this is where we take our output. So we're seeing 9 volts at the output as well. And this will go off to a speaker. But we'll not worry about that for now. So we've got a 9 volt potential difference, you can see. Like, voltage is also called potential, because you can only have voltage between two points. Voltage is the difference in voltage potential. It's a force that exists between two points. So we've got 9 minus 0. Nice and easy. 9. <laughs> 9 volt potential difference across this resistor. And if you know Ohm's law, you know that the voltage and the resistance and the current are all related to one another proportionally, right? I'll move this out of the way. I'll just write this up here. So V, the voltage, is equal to the current times the resistance. Or if we rearrange that by dividing through by the resistance, so we divide this side by R, and we divide this side by R, because what you do to one side, you have to do to the other, right? These R's cancel out, because R divided by R is just one, and Whenever we have one, we can just pretend it's not there. So we know that the current that's going through this resistor is proportional to the voltage across the resistor times by the resistance value. Right, so this is a variable resistor. Let's say it's set to 10K. That'll, that'll become important later on. So what basically is going to happen is we're going to have a current that flows in this direction, right, because we've got a positive potential difference. Positive because we've got more voltage here than we have here. Right, so the current is going to flow from the positive to the negative, it's called conventional current. And it's going to go across here, down to ground. Now current, it's, does it flow through a capacitor? It doesn't really matter for now. Let's just think of it as flowing through this capacitor, down to ground, and it's going to charge this capacitor up, because that's what capacitors do, they hold charge. Um, and the voltage on this capacitor is going to slowly rise as it accumulates charge. Right, and as that happens, we see the voltage here rises and we go over this six volt threshold and then everything changes, right? Because this op amp can switch the output now. So let's go to this point here where everything changes. So this is approximately six volts. It's actually just over six volts, but we won't worry about that for now because it doesn't really matter for the purpose of this analysis. So this is now at six volts. Now the output has gone down to zero volts. So the output has gone down to zero volts, which means that this node here is at zero volts, which means that this point here now is at zero volts. And now what, what is this point here at? Well, we know because it's attached to the positive end of this capacitor, which is charged up to six volts, we can see on our graph, this node here, this whole side of the equation is at six volts. So now if we have 6 volts here and 0 volts here, we've now got a positive potential flowing in the other direction, right? So now, thanks to Ohm's law, we know this is the same resistance. We've got 6 volts coming from here to here, so we're going to have a current flowing this way through the circuit. And what that's going to do is drain the capacitor. And the capacitor is going to drain down and down and down and down and down and down 
until you guessed it, we cross over this threshold again. Now we're at 2.99999 volts, just below three volts. Let's call it three volts. Oops. So we're at three volts here. So we're at three volts here. And now this is considered a low state by the op amp, so it's gonna switch the output high again. So this is gonna to go to nine volts. This is gonna to go to nine volts on the output. This is gonna to go to nine volts. Okay, so now we have a six volt potential difference coming this way from here to here. That's gonna charge this capacitor back up. Um, I'll just do the output first. So the output, the input went low, so the output went high as we just said. And now that the output's gone high, this is set this side high, so that's gonna create a current flow down this way, which is gonna charge this capacitor back up until it goes over six volts again. And then the output is gonna swing low because it's inverting. And then that's gonna cause the capacitor to drain. And that cycle is gonna go on and on whilst the circuit still has power. Okay, so here we are on the breadboard. Um, if you've never seen a breadboard before, this is what they look like. Uh, you'll usually have, this is a fancy one with loads kind of connected together and it's got all power up here and other things, which is great, but not necessary at all. Um, all you need is just one of these ordinary breadboard, get one off Amazon or wherever you want to get one from. Um, these strips down here where you connect the power all of these lines in this first left hand column are connected. Sometimes I have a little break here, which you can see the break in the ink. I've got little jumpers across there just to take the power all the way down. And they're really designed for connecting your power to. So you can see here, I've got power coming in from over here and I've jumped it down onto here. And this red one um, is where I've got my positive voltage coming in. And this is negative voltage or ground in our case, because we're just using a nine volt battery. And uh, so here's the chip in question, CD40106. And um, here's the little nubbin that I was talking about before. And uh, so that means that this is pin one. So we're just gonna put this in the breadboard. So in the breadboard, it's actually the other way around. So these, where they're all connected from top to bottom, breadboards are connected in rows. These five here above my finger are all connected. And the next five, these are all connected. So if we put this in here like this, you can see there's a break in the middle where we put the IC across. IC stands for integrated circuit, which is what one of these is. We just pop that and push it in there so that it's nice and in. And there we go. Um, so now we have access to each pin and we can neatly connect things up however we like. So first thing we're going to do is take one of these little jumper thing, which if you get a breadboard kit, you'll get a breadboard with a load of these and some battery connectors and things like that. They're really great for uh, starting out. And so where we've got our power coming in here, so this is where you'd connect your um, nine volt battery connector. And we're just gonna pop that in there. So that's connected now to this pin, which is pin 14. Remember we go around and then across and then back up. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. All right, and then that's just gonna go in there and that's gonna supply power. I have the power off right now. It's probably a good idea to connect everything up and then connect your power so you don't accidentally connect power to the wrong thing and you can end up blowing stuff up. But a piece of advice I would give you is don't be too afraid of blowing stuff up because you're almost inevitably gonna blow something up. And when it happens, it's actually, it's not that bad. It's quite funny, really. So don't be worried about blowing stuff up. All right, so we're gonna connect ground over to this far left strip here which is the ground connection on this breadboard. I'm just gonna move this all the way over here. So you see all these five, so these would all be the same connection. I'm just gonna move it right over here. I'm just gonna move this right over here, just so that you can see a little bit better. Right, so now the next thing we're gonna add, I'm gonna add that capacitor down to ground. All right, these are quite good for beginners. You can get these online in like kits and um, just a sorted values of capacitors already sorted out for you. It tells you what value is in, so these correlate to all of these and you, don't really have to worry too much about um, which capacitor, because it can be really complicated. So it's got 0 0.1 microfarads, which is not what we want. We calculated 1.14, which is the nearest one is this. So remember I said there's tolerance, so they're plus minus kind of 20%. So it's one microfarad, but it could be 0 0.8 microfarads. It could be 1.2 microfarads. So um, just pick the closest value to yours. 
these can be kind of confusing. You can get like charts and things on your phone to type in and make sure that you've got the right value while you learn how to um, figure out what's the right one. So we're gonna open this up, get a one microfarad capacitor out and put it between ground and pin one. So now the next thing is we want our 10K variable resistor, which we've got here. We want to make sure it says 10K. It doesn't matter if it's A or B, that's just if it's linear or logarithmic taper, which doesn't really matter what that means right now. So we're just gonna put this in. I'm gonna put it in here on the breadboard, just on a blank set here, but you can put it down here. Remember that the, power, the breadboard connections are this way. So just make sure you don't put it like here because it's gonna connect up to one of the pins on the IC and you don't want that. So I'm just gonna put it over here so that you can see what I'm doing nice and simply. And then actually how a potentiometer works is this middle lug here is connected to the end. There's a little wiper on the end of there that wipes around the edge. And then these two are connected to a strip which goes all the way around of resistive material. Oh, I think I've just had that off screen. So that all the way around here is resistive material. And so if you have this wiper set all the way to the right, say, then between these two now there's zero ohms practically because the wiper is all the way down here. So there's practically no resistive material in circuit, whereas between these two, there's 10K, because that's as much of the resistive material as you can have. So you're like basically changing the length of the resistive material by moving this wiper. So we're gonna have it like this, so that all the way to the left, all the way down, is a 10K, so that as we increase the pot, you know, turning it to the right feels like you're increasing it, so you want that to increase the pitch. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're going to Simply connect up this top, as you guys see it, um, lug of the potentiometer. And it doesn't matter which way you connect this, the top one, the potentiometer just needs to go, as it did in the circuit, between pins one and two. We have this all connected up now. What I'm gonna do next is I've got a pair of computer monitors on this desk, which I use for sound output. It's useful to use a pair of computer monitors early on because if you just connect it up to like a little 8 ohm loudspeaker that you might have around from a beginner's kit or something you're gonna come into some problems with um, something called impedance matching and you're gonna load down is the technical term the sound output and you might get no sound out at all whereas with the uh, computer speakers it's got circuitry in at the input which will allow you to ba connect basically anything up to it and it will um, sort all the, uh, so I'm just gonna, this is my, going to my speakers. I'm gonna put it on pin two, because remember that was our output. Okay, I'm just gonna put it there. And now I'm gonna turn the power on and we should hear that buzzing. And it should be, I'll get this set all the way down to zero. It should be around an A. Okay then, so I thought it would be a bit better if we uh, hooked the scope up for this bit. So I'm going to switch the power on to the circuit and there we go. Turn the thing all the way down and turn the sound on. Here we can see I've hooked up the um, positive end of that capacitor so we can see it charging up here and discharging and how, um, so this is a low period where it's charging up and we've inverted it to be high. And then we go over this threshold and it goes low again because we're inverting it and it discharges. And so it's exactly how we saw it on the screen, on the uh, board, sorry, but it's always nice to see it work out. So yeah, that's going to be all for this time. Come back next time. We're going to go into some more complex waveforms. We're going to go into filtering and then drums and we've got sequences and stuff to come. I know this was a bit long and theory heavy, but now that we've gotten the basic operation of this chip out of the way, hopefully in the future we won't need to go quite in so much depth. So I'll see you next time.